for the phenomena of hegemony and American ascendancy. The three questions to be asked and answered are, one, why did Britain experience relative economic decline so rapidly after 1870? Two, what were the sources of America's enormous relative wealth, productivity edge, and geoeconomic and geopolitical weight in the 1870 and since era of modern economic growth? Three, how did the fact that the long 20th century was, in everything that counts, an American century matter for the world? Think about those questions and try to formulate your own answers to those questions rather than just memorizing mine and talk with your peers. The point, after all, is to build durable connections and resources within your brain, not to stagger to the final exam with forgettable nuggets you can parrot that you then forget. Let us go back to 1700 or 1870 or 1830 or even 1865. From any of those years' standpoints, you would not have thought it very likely that the United States would become the economic, political, and even cultural hub of the English-speaking part of the world, and indeed of the whole world. As you looked around, you would see and think that Britain and London had advantages that would continue to give them preeminence, and preeminence for what seemed likely to be centrals centuries. The crown jewel of these advantages was Britain's possession of machinery and steam, almost exclusive possession as late as 1830. Close beyond were the advantages in power that Britain could draw from its empire. Now it is true that up until 1870 the United States had been growing very rapidly indeed for a country in the age of the Industrial Revolution. But a great deal of that growth was not growth in living standards and productivity levels. It was rather growth in numbers, from natural increase and from immigration. And growth was primarily fueled not by extraordinary technological advances, but by truly extraordinary engrossment of resources, as the United States conquered the lion's share of North America's resources from the Native Americans, from the First Nations. Now, it is certainly true that the United States took technological progress in a resource and energy-using and labor-saving direction, but up until 1870, the edge provided to buy those technologies of the American system was minor. Afterwards, it was going to be bigger. After 1870, however, with the closing of the geographic frontier, America turned to the technological and educational frontiers and American economic growth took off like a rocket. A uniquely well-educated labor force, the place where industrial research laboratories were first developed, the availability of a continent-wide market that made the profits from developing extremely large-scale modern corporations obvious and graspable. All these meant that America rapidly developed and then rapidly deployed a technological and productivity edge over all the rest of the world that kept on increasing from decade to decade up until the 1950s. Save for the sheep-raising agricultural powerhouses of Australia and New Zealand, which matched America's pace and living standards for a while, and save for Germany, which kept pace in research and development. But not in productivity and deployment, not until the 1970s. Um, America truly did become, in Leon Trotsky's words, the furnace where the future was being forged. Germany, um, Germany's a very interesting case. The rapid growth of the German engineering tradition meant that from 1870 on, in internal combustion engines and in organic chemistry and in electricity especially, German companies kept pace with American companies in products and technological sophistication. But where Germany did not keep pace with America was with manufacturing productivity. Consider the 1940s, you know, during World War II. It took the Nazis, um, controlling the German economy, 150,000 man-hours, 50-person years' worth of work to produce a Panther tank. In America, it took only 10,000 man-hours to produce a Sherman tank, one-fifteenth as much. 
Admittedly, those of us who know rather too much that is good for us about the details of World War II-era armored fighting vehicles know well that a Panther was twice the tank of a Sherman. But still, the fact that the United States could produce a B-24 bomber for less in the way of resources than the Nazis needed to produce a single Tiger tank that may well be the single most important reason the world today is not ruled by Nazi Germany and fascist imperial Japan. Parenthetically, um, parenthetically it also took about 10,000 man-hours for the Soviet Union, the Russians, to build a T-34 sea tank during World War II. Although, do note that the T-34 was only about half as much tank as a Sherman. It was built so that it would break down after no more than 24 hours of active combat operations. So intense was the fighting on the Eastern Front of World War II that that is how long it would survive. It would have been a mistake to build it any stronger, any more robust, any more finely machined, any more functional. By contrast, the Sherman was built to drive from Cherbourg in France and Normandy to Prague in Czechia, on the other side of Germany, without suffering more than minor mechanical breakdowns that could be fixed on the spot. Moreover, the similarity between Russian and American build times, um, it should not be a great surprise. Russian and American tank factories were all designed by the same engineers who had also and earlier designed America's automobile assembly lines, the pioneering automobile assembly lines in the 1930s. Now, um, you would have imagined that Great Britain, as the world's first industrial nation, as the world's leader in science and technology in the late 1800s, would have led the way in the discovery, development, and deployment of the high technologies of the years after 1870. Led the way in um, industries like sophisticated and high-quality alloy steels, internal combustion engines, organic chemistry, electricity, aviation, communications, etc. But no. Indeed, many of these were discovered in Britain. Indeed, some of these were developed in Britain. But all were first deployed, and then were deployed at mass scale, not in Britain, but primarily in the United States and secondarily in Germany. Britain is the only country that does not see a material acceleration in the pace at which its manufacturing productivity sectors improves when you compare 1870 to 1914 with 1800 to 1870. It does not seem to have benefited much from the industrial research labs and from the development of modern corporations. This is a mystery and a puzzle. I gesture at some possible solutions to it in the PowerPoints, but these are only suggestions and guesses. And then there is the question, there is the question of what difference it made for history. That during the age of modern economic growth, it was America and not some other country. That was, as Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky said, the furnace where the future was being forged. Think about that question. Our attempts to answer it will, at least partly, underpin a great deal of the rest of this course.